Welcome back to season two here at the Snap Judgments League, ladies and gentlemen. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming, and we are live here on Twitch, casting the games here from round number one of the Snap Judgments League. If you want to take a look at this action as it happens, come join us typically Mondays or Tuesdays. We will be casting these games here live on my Twitch channel, It's Guest Gaming. And look, we have a lot of cool things to take a look at because the meta is consistently changing. The decks that we saw from season one are really not really anywhere close to as relevant going into season two. So who is going to be able to take down season two? And more importantly, what are they going to take it down with? So we have a couple of games that we're gonna be casting today to take a look at the competitive scene right now in Marvel Snap. And this is easily able to be joined. If you take a look during the live stream, you'll be able to do exclamation point S J L. That's the Snap Judgments League. If you're over on YouTube, you should be able to see down below a link that'll take you over to their Discord. For more information, you can always contact Gunny T as well as Pulse Glazer to get more information about joining future iterations of the Snap Judgments League. Now, let's go on in. Let's get to the battles. That's why you're here. You're looking to see some competitive Marvel Snap. So the first thing that we're going to be starting off with is going to be Sky Zorro. We're starting today off with Sky Zorro in the very first match, facing off against Just Ken, also known as Derek, who has been here actually several times, but let's start it. This is, as you see, a recorded playback. All of these games for all of these casts that we do here live have been submitted to me, but I have not watched any of the games. I am casting them as I see them as we see. A Nihilus, Mockingbird, Death, and Hood drop into the Bifrost here on turn number one versus an Iceman to raise the cost of that Mockingbird, which might be counterproductive, but we'll see how the Iceman hits. This is all live to me. My t Twitch chat, which you'll see is live over on the side there, is interacting the exact same way. We're all finding out together what's going on impromptu here at the moment because we want to make sure that we can get as many people out there in the competitive Marvel Snap scene and give them a spotlight no matter when they had a battle, no matter what they did to be a part of this competition. We want to give them that opportunity. So I watch these live for you so we can have a good time casting it out as the demon is going to try to undo some of what the hood is doing in the Bifrost because everybody's going to do a cha-cha slide as of right now into the Nexus and that hood does put a detriment on just Ken. We have a hood on the opposite side versus that pixie, so we could see, there it is, there's the beast, bi beast pixie bounce combo to really mess up the Nexus and get extra six power cards into their hand. Shang-Chi not looking too promising right now, but as we look at what Just Ken's putting down on the board, this looks to be that squirrel girl combination package. And you can tell from the 5-7 Lady Deathstrike that this was recorded prior to the update to Lady Deathstrike turning into a 5-6 on reveal. So there will be small little changes in some of the competition battles that you see based on when the OTA happened versus when we take a look at these battles live. So keep that in mind for a couple of these presentations. I don't think it's going to be game changing as we get a snap for the very first time in this battle but it's something that's always worth iterating just to be on top of it. Uh, that Lady Death Strike's looking pretty good as an option to clear out the hood, but Ken doesn't see any further lines from it, decides to retreat, give a cube over the Sky Zoro, and allow us to go into round number two. But I ask you here, here, if you're a part of the live chat, if you had one deck to take for a $1,000 competition, what would it be and why? And I ask this the same for the YouTube comments down below too. If you had to join a competition at your own luxury and you had a full collection available to you, because we know not everybody has a full collection, what would you bring in and why? All of the collapsed mine rocks, while could be looked at as a detriment, could potentially play into Ken's piece here, but it's incredibly important that he sees that skip on turn two to capitalize on debris on turn three. Collapsed mine does destroy all rock. So say, for example, Sky, if you haven't seen it before, Sky Zero could have put down a card and then Debris could have put down all those rocks. Collapsed Mine will destroy the rocks afterwards as well. It's a very weird thing. I understand that's the wording. It just, I always feel like it's wrong. Take advantage of the short layout of the White Widow. 
into the kiln, looking at less likeliness to see a clog happen in there as Pixie comes on back down once again. We haven't seen a Mobius yet, but that spider ham flipping the pig to a 510 could have been a downfall is now actually a huge perk. And sitting on a 112 death due to the perk of collapsed mine has got to feel good as we go in with two cubes into this next turn with the Annie on top of it. Looking to play into the clog line a lot more, feeling confident that they're going to be able to take the kiln as well, knowing that they're only going to shoot up to seven, but if they undo anything with the Widow's Kiss, it's only going to be a five uh, power card that's needed as Debris throws rocks all over the board, and the Beast is going to bring it all back into the hand and undo the negative effect of the Widow's Kiss simultaneously. So it is currently still a one lane as Blink is going to be flipping that Beast out into the deck and put a Doctor Doom on the board to lay those Doom bots into the Collapse Mine and Orcus Forge. Still keeping a lead into the kiln. Great flip, though. However, it does put them at a huge deficit. Sitting on that 112 death is the ultimate key here. I almost would contemplate not putting down the White Widow in case if you accidentally lock out your opponent on turn five and give them that hope to continue on in the match. But it looks like they're going to go for the clog. It's a double White Widow moment. It's Widow on Widow as the hood comes on down, secures the Orcus Forge lane temporarily over on the left because the ordering actually with Annihilus is incredibly important here. Hood being destroyed would follow then with the Widow's Kiss ongoing, then hitting negative four, and then it would be destroyed as well. So hopefully we see that combination happen, but they're not going to take advantage of it. Instead, they're just going to overload into the Collapse Mine put down the death to demon and the sentinel because sentinel because reasons and just go sta scaling over the top. Sky Zoro thought he had it, but that surprise death definitely was not something they were necessarily expecting as they get their final skip, which reduces down that widow's kiss also in Orcus Forge. As we talked about collapsed mine at the end of the turn will kill all rocks. And because they didn't play a card on turn number six, it therefore reactivated and destroyed all rocks. Hence the reduction in that final lane, but it's four cubes being removed off of Sky Zoro as we move into Dream Dimension here in the first location. Now at a nine to six lead for Derek, also known as just Ken. Looking at a demon flip for the hood. Nico on one into that's always got to feel good. And now you're looking to play hood away from Ant Maze. Otherwise, the hood that gets flipped would be getting on the extra bonus. And you don't want that to apply. That carnage also is a very viable option, too. Goes for the hood onto the side, flips it over into the demon as we flip on the opposite end. The White Widow. And Los Diablos base now might be pushing both players to play into the middle lane and capitalize on that bonus from Ant May's now. Risky to do it in reverse order in case if the demon does land in the dream dimension, that might be a mistake. We could see a nine power destruction. And it is, it destroys it. So yes, it's going to reduce down the death, but order is incredibly important as they realize their mistake and put out the Deadpool. And Pixie flip flops the deck with an Iceman in the dream dimension now too. And it's the Dream Dimension that gets hit by Los Diablos. I know, big oofs in the chat, big oofs in the chat. Missed opportunity. As they look to either clog the ruins or take a pretty resounding lead to help counteract a potential Annihilus sending over a hood. Here comes the Beast to bounce everybody back into the hand again. They've had that Beast consistently before turn four several times now already in this match. 
as they now get presented with a Lady Deathstrike option for the Widow's Kiss. Nice lead over into the ruins, putting a 24 power and a very high deficit into Los Diablos. Plus, then you also have the flexibility of the Mockingbird, which could also try to reclaim the middle lane as well if needed, if all of a sudden we see a large enough lockdown, for example, in Los Diablos early. Guys, are all thinking, how can he interfere with probably Los Diablos more than any other lane right now as the sentry puts the void over to Los Diablos. Hood comes on down into the ruins, puts another demon into the hands. So it's demon on demon on demon, and Blink is going to transform that by swapping it into the deck for a roll into the ruins, which is a really high rock and rulk right now. And it bounces back the middle lane. Rulk shoots up to 13 power. So now tiebreaker situation gives the advantage to Sky Zoro. But with that giant flip from Lady Deathstrike, will it be enough to maintain the left lane? It would fully clear them with a 13 point lead over into Los Diablos. However, the threat of Rulk going up is more important because if they play the LDS, then Rulk is guaranteed to go up for also. Tough scenario for Ken here, because they're without anything in the middle lane to be able to assist that Mockingbird. Kind of a uh, kind of a loss all, and it's going to end up being a retreat later situation for for old Ken. There's too much risk involved, too much unknown, making a pretty resound decision here to retreat later and let Sky decide if it's worth it to go forward also. Eight to six leads us into the final of the single stakes. And nothing but twos to start with the White Widow and the Carnage. And a pretty nice hit for Ken with Spider-Ham turning the pig into a 4-10 pig with Sinister London now on the board too. We could end up seeing a lot of Widowing right now as we get a double up Nico Minoru in two lanes and White Widow's gonna put down Widow's Kiss number one, flip a copy over to the Westview, put out a Widow's Kiss number two. It's a pretty weak Westview now. They may have to target that one specifically separately and Limbo definitely favors Ken in this current matchup. I like the Gladiator call now, take it on the curve, because if there's that potential that you pull there in Nihilus, you can still fire back all those Widow's Kisses if need may be. Sure, you could pull a Rel. You could also pull a very key core piece and remove their clog potential too. As Gladiator comes on down, makes its initial push here into the Sinister London, pulls down the White Widow, which puts out a Widow's Kiss. It's gonna destroy the White Widow, leaving the Kiss behind like a grandmother on Valentine's Day. And Falcon's going to be bouncing back, clearing and, sca and saving Sky Zorro from some really severe ailments. And now it ends up becoming a race of the Annihilus. Do they have it in the hand? As Annie is sitting in Ken's hand to be able to fire over a Widow's Kiss. Do you clear Widow's Kiss on turn four? I mean, excuse me, on turn five and play the pig into multiplicity. I think you end up actually in a pretty strong situation by not wanting to play anything into the mid and looking to Annihilus. Therefore, if you Annihilus now into Limbo or District X, both work, the negative effect of that middle Widow's Kiss still applies and that's a really strong play knowing that you're not going to have to convert anything with the hood og ultron is also sitting in the hand who is a nice filler for the final turn if need may be because th that ultron is going to put out the one power doom bots based on the uh, sorry the one power drones based on the 
scheduling of this match. And there's the fire over of the Widow's Kiss after. Nico puts in which spell? It hasn't populated on top, so not certain. Gonna have to potentially click into it. Pigs and M'Bakus and friends, oh my. I like it. And he leaves the space open for a secondary dupe. As Magneto's gonna drag Gladiator back on over, so no secondary dupe, but keeping Sinister London free and available as it brings another Magneto via the Sinister London from it registering and loading Limbo up. Interesting play choices now need to lie down, and Ken has the advantage here of also filling the entire board to prevent a potential Annihilus if Sky opened up with it before turn four. <whistles> Big Shang-Chi to clear the Magnetos and then clog the board with multiple man and M'Baku is the line, but Sky Zoro says it's not enough. Backs on out. Yeah, one big rulk could ruin or break the day, but would not have laid out the way he needed. He go with a flip upgrade to debris. Nice three power upgrade. Knowing the movements of that Bifrost, I think, is probably the most frustrating part right now for Ken trying to capitalize on Debris. As an Altar of Death now throws another wrench into the potential plan of Debris landing in that lane. Instead, they're going to have to satisfy for the Clog, put three cards in that lane, and then maybe we end up seeing an LDS on top of it as a Sacrificial Lamb or Sacrificial Lady later on dropping down the, the expense on the death. We get a snap. I believe it's from Sky Zoro looking to push Ken in as he sits with a three cube lead right now. Playing from behind on this. Huh. There it goes. They drop it on down. Here comes the carnage for the first destroy. Dr. Doom's going to put some extra value over into the altar of death as the rock is also going to slide over after the hood decides to disappear. Put extra mana on into play for turn five. Rock and Dr. Doom go for the clear. And it's a 10 to six lead in the right lane. Now trying to compete with that Rulk is pretty tough. But looking on the potential blob, very sacrificial line. LDS is going to backfire, so I think showing a little bit of pressure on the left is fine. Considering you're already pushed in for four cubes, you got to go to six anyway. But we could be just hoping on a Shang-Chi top deck. 
as they drop four cards, which include that spider ham again, hitting that <laughs> can't win situation. And a white widow after the falcon and a demon. Here comes death while they sit on a 510 pig. Tough call here because that White Widow specifically could have had potential in the Altar of Death. But there's not enough value to try to maintain either the Bifrost or the Icebox. Two, of course it's twos and fives, and then your only one is a negative. It's a rough spot to be in. And I'm not sure what he's doing here. I'm not sure what he's doing here. He would have sacrificed himself entirely had he allowed, if Zoro had already submit their play, Ken would have literally submit a lane win exclusively on the left and sacrificed both losing lanes in the mid and the right. Caught it, retreated, and instead is now sitting at a small deficit for the first time as they switch it up with Weird World. Many of these cards are also overlapping. As now it becomes a a flex fest with a space throne locking the hood into its only position. With top option probably resting on Gladiator, I assume they're gonna need to play that 3 8 into the space throne to try to maintain the possession of the lane. an Elysium 2. It's a build your own Loki match. And he locks him in with the debris in the space throne. You know he's smiling right now. Sky Zoro has got to feel good after getting that rock secured. Missed opportunity with the Gladiator into Space Throne, thinking that Falcon was not going to get pulled. But based on early locking, it looks like that is the case. Blink from your opponent, but Gladiator from yourself. Blink is going to realize as it pulls out LDS that there is hope in that left lane. As we start Carnage Demon, where we now expect a two card play here on turn five. Now expecting potentially Falcon to drop right now. Guy Zero is now forced to eat in the Widow's Bite, uh, sorry, Widow's Kiss El Elysium Lane. Ooh, the Doom gets hit and the Hood gets destroyed. So instead of bouncing it back, it's just 
a destroy. And they're sitting on death sentry for 22 power. But Ken has to worry about two cards dropping. And he lets it fly as Shang-Chi flies and destroys Rolk, drops down the Widow's Kiss, and Gladiator hits into the Space Throne. Surprising call from just Ken, who may have just made a simple mistake as he loses his last four cubes to Sky Zoro. Weird World throwing some weird punches here in match number one for the Snap Judgments League. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning of what we have here for round one, week one of season two. Stick around. We'll be right back. Obviously. So, Did someone call a doctor? No? Then I have no idea why this next guy is being cast because it is Doc D Snap here versus Player Two. Let's find out what they have to go bring on down right now. As we see Luke Cage, Shang-Chi, Storm, and Doctor Doom in hand. Doc D rocking one hell of a beautiful deck. Look at that. Look at the all of the sing the beautiful lines right there. Everything is blue bordered. Everything is inked or golden now because we pulled Jeff here on turn two. Nice, nice experience that deck coming in from Doc D Snap as he knows immediately it's worth retreating. Not looking at good locations. Doesn't want to reveal too much information. Let's give a cube over to player two if you don't like what you already see and move on. Moving here into round number two. Iceman Jeff Storm, a nice one, two, three to kickstart us off with Legion on top of it, looking for that Storm Legion cheaty, cheeky little mechanic y thingy, and possibly try to steal a lane as well. So we could see a skip here on turn two if they're looking at a three, four, five play of Storm on four. With Olympia giving extra cards in the hand. This is a beautiful setup right here. Beautiful setup right here as we get a dancing coffee mug because, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a purchase here on the It's Guest Gaming channel here on Twitch. I have my coffee merchandise Marvel Snap inspired line, which you can find here given the links down below and go to itsguestgaming.shop and pick up your Cerebru Dark Hawk, uh, Dark Hawk Roast, or your own inspired Hella Good Mug today. So I appreciate the shameless self-promotion as we see Nidavellir drop on down, but be flipped via that storm and move through, trying to keep up with Thor in the flooding. Sitting on a one, two, three with Ms. Marvel in hand also is pretty nice because that's going to flood up another five, kind of forcing a lane clog plus a hammer. And we might have seen it as Red Guardian's going to drop down two of the power off of White Widow from two down to zero. The Rocket Raccoon does not go up, so it is going to be dependent on if they can pull out a Mjolnir. Because even if they tried to compensate with Jeff, it would backfire. But I like this Legion play in playing into double reduction. So even if they do play it down, their side's going to drop down. But the Luke Cage is going to prevent their own. Here's the Jotunheim for days. As Legion makes it a lot more difficult to have to deal with. That lizard with Luke Cage looks really good right now. Really good right now. It'd bring the Legion back up another one. Lizard won't drop down. That means it'd be seven, five, and four. 16 then into Jotunheim to drop. Player two 
would have their Jotunheim, their far right Jotunheim lane drop to a flat zero. Thor could bring it back up to six, but that would not be enough. Tiebreaker would end up benefiting Docti, and I think player two knew that as well. Hence the retreat, and we move to round number three. Playing into the dark with the far right nebula. Playing into the Stark, probably, with Jeff. That's my guess. What would you do, Blizzard or Jeff? Goes for the priority play here, looking at Blizzard instead. Player two drops their armor to shoot up. Throne room could be precarious considering the Shang-Chi in hand and knowing that armor is already down in Stark Tower. Just goes for a light interference here, puts down the Jeff into the mid and Iceman on the left as Red Guardian's gonna remove the ability out of Nebula, drop it back down to one. It takes on the throne room buff and give some floating indiscretion by dropping that Ms. Marvel into the mid after Jeff is gonna wait till turn six to move because it's gonna take on the Stark Power plus two first. They also go for their Thor into Stark Tower. Maybe they top deck, maybe they don't, but probably leaning on a Jane Foster into throne room to really give some extra power too. I'd be ready to see a double up there considering it can't go to the big house. Ooh, three cards drop for player two instead into Stark Tower. They clog the lane by playing their own Jeff, Nebula, and a White Widow into the big house to take the lead in the big house side also as well on card advantage. That Widow's Kiss is going to continue to register as only a zero thanks to Luke Cage. And they can still slide that Jeff in there if they need to. Maintain the bonus and maybe play on top by using the Doctor Doom to spread wide. To be the safest call there, you end up with a zero, one, two, and six with the Doom bot. Player two thinks that it's probably coming on down. They can't keep up with the middle lane by doing so. Take the run, give the cube. It is nine to seven, lead for Doc D snap over player two. And the altar of death looking very good for that white widow right now. Easy lane win, but you might want to reserve that for your third lane, knowing that Nebula is going to scale all by itself. We do know they also have a Jeff, so Jeff could move in. See, they took that strategy on their own end. They play down their White Widow into the Altar of Death, leave that negative four on the board, and take the extra energy along the way. With an Attilan causing a snap. As they look for their own shuffle up and deal, build your own OG crystal reaction. And it snaps player two out. They're too scared after seeing the Attilan. Wow. I like that snap in particular because they had extra energy to work with on turn three, play out a bunch of cards or a high power card and then YOLO that shuffle back in. The line that they were pr predicating on could not have been fulfilled the way that they wanted to. Docti contests the nebula with an Iceman in the same lane while two ninjas pop up into the Shadowland.
and the Red Guardian, as tempting as it would be to stop the Jeff, is going to backfire. The Jeff placement into the white hot room and then playing around it by playing that storm into the Jeff lane brings so much less concern. It's a great option right there, and I like the Red Guardian on top of it too to restrict Jeff if need may be. They opt for the Luke Cage instead as Beta Ray Bill puts down his horsey hammer back into the deck, shuffles it up. Luke Cage drops in with a Rulk in hand. And a tough scenario to contest with. Because even the Ms. Marvel giving only one side a bonus ends up being very restrictive simultaneously. They drop down the Legion for straight power into the Dark Dimension, but it's not enough to try to steal everything back, even if they had played down the Ms. Marvel plus the Doctor Doom, trying to stretch out to stay over the top in the Flooded would have been incredibly difficult, knowing that Jeff could have also rotated out as well. And the retreat later pays off. No one drops a key. Everybody runs. Everybody says it's time to move on. And we shall. It is a 9 to 6 lead. Dock the over player 2. The priority build for player 2 is very interesting into this matchup. Because it plays into what both players are essentially trying to do. Docti is looking to play into these location control, actually, like, specialty pieces. As we get squirrels everywhere galore. Really now looking for that, that loot cage. They're both consistently pushing and trying to fight for their appropriate priority. The squirrels are going to make it a lot harder as they go two for two for matchups. Exactly. They both point. As we could see a red guardian try to take a little bit of extra off the squirrel. Yep, takes a little bit off the squirrel. So nice five power play into the left as they go for their own five power play into the mid. Ooh, cheeky double twos. Probably going to end up being just a simple rock play as we get a snap to try to push player to have player two try to push Docti in for five, six, seven cubes. Sorry, six cubes altogether would have been. But Docti's not having any of it. We move to round seven. Docti still with the lead, seven to six, here in round seven. Incredible cube equity for both players, maintaining cube by cube by cube, looking, knowing when and when to retreat, when to really super capitalize on everything. This is tough. Nebula Vault guaranteed 1-3, essentially, minus a Jeff. But Jeff's been played down simultaneously, so... Now we're looking at a snap of the Red Guardian to try and restrict the Nebula. Player 2's got to see the Red Guardian coming onto Nebula. That's a very strong snap for that moment. Even if they take on the rock, there you go. Negative one onto that nebula is going to lock it in for good as they get their own Thor into the Eternity range, which is also going to throw a rock onto Docti's side. They're now pushed in for four cubes. So huge game moment on this swing. 
Undetermined movement for Jeff allows for the Ms. Marvel to drop into the mid and still keep the play out. White Widow's gonna add a Widow's Kiss into the vault, try to undo some of that negativity, but the Ms. Marvel rebalances it back out, puts the lead onto Docti's side, has the priority going into the final turn. And now they have the luxury of locking the entire game board down and do so. The vault is going to triple lock itself over the entire board. Here comes the Beta Ray Bill, who's gonna sit at only seven power. That's not gonna be enough to maintain the lead in two lanes. So only a Jeff the Baby Landshark could potentially save this match. It is a 50-50 on a Jeff placement from player two. If they play it into the mid with no movement, they win. If they play it into the right with Jeff movement, they win. It is a 50-50 situation. And they play their Jeff without the Jeff movement and Docti snipes out six cubes out the bottom of player two on the chance of Jeff maybe possibly moving. Trying to sneak out a win, Docti holds on because of the fake out of Jeff the baby land shark. Beautiful play lines from both players, but the indecision, it was just a coin flip and that coin flip cost six cubes out of player two. That was a very, very risky final play. I agree with the chat right here. What would you have done? Would you have stayed in that final moment for six cubes and seen it through knowing that it could all come down to will they move or not? What would you have done? Let me know down in the comments below and we'll be right back not cool. Ladies and gentlemen, this ends up being the portion of the Snap Judgments League where I must earn my keep. I must simply say that if I do not show this next match, I don't know if I'll be doing any further weeks. Why? Because he's my boss. Here we go as we show Gunny T versus Cold going into game match. Number one, it is Gunny T. Let's see what they have to bring to the table. Are they actually just a mod or do they really have the competitive spirit? Let's find out as he brings on down a Squirrel Girl, Maximus, Cull Obsidian, and Zero into his hand. Interesting lineup. It's like a Mockingbird Zero build. Maybe uh, maybe we see uh, Mysterio. Maybe we see... I'm not sure, actually. What else could be there? But um, I know a Nexus has got to feel good. Here's a Blob in a, in, in a very, very rare place. Not in Thanos. Gold doesn't want to deal with the Nexus whatsoever. Gunny says, screw you or thank you and decides to move into round number two as we will slowly be reaching out to Gunny for uh, inappropriate conduct here on U YouTube by showing that Ms. Marvel on screen. We apologize, folks, that you had to experience that. However, we are gonna be moving into Murder World and go with the same exact play line and he snaps right away. Seeing the 0-1-1 into Maximus being blanked out on two, that push of Pryo feels really strong to Gunny with this deck, and he continues to snap with that play line. This time, Cold moves forward with it as they get rid of their Santa Korg in the murder world, and Zero is going to wait to reduce down the Maximus. Here comes a White Palace, which is going to pass a Crossbones over to Cold, and Cold is going to pass over a Darkhawk and inked tribute Darkhawk at that over to Gunny. as we have another merchandise purchase in the middle of the Snap Judgments League. Thank you so much to Fuss Funner and GC James. During this live broadcast, we've had two visits over to itsguestgaming.shop and supporting my content as much as I try to do here for this community with our Marvel-inspired coffee 
and T mug line where you can find your Earl Jean Grey, your Shang Chai, and more ready and available for you at itsguestgaming.shop. Thank you so much for that support. I greatly appreciate it as we move looking at Cosmo trying to hold the kiln down with nine power in total. What does it stop? And it's the hood who sits now at a negative three and gives a nice lead over into turn number four. Goes with a super tall kiln line in case if he tries to get cheeky with something else, but it looks like they're both going to play down each of Gunny's co uh, crossbones, and it now all comes down to a race for the White Palace. 15 over two turns could be done over in Murder World, but showing threat instead of just let it be in the center lane seems to be the line to work with. Yeah, that's the line they're going to rock. They're going to both drop down their Darkhawks, but the advantage probably pushes towards Gunny just because their Darkhawk is out of range of Shang-Chi. And instead of going all in on the White Palace and putting themselves in a shang chi position, they're taking that risk chance and playing in the blob into Murder World for a potential tie minimum. Interesting. And they go for the Uber protection instead. We could see Rock Slide come down and we get a snap for eight cubes, which is really going to push hard here in round two. Are they going to go for eight? This would drop both players down to almost nothing. Here's the armor in the mid, sacrificing the murder world with the Cull Obsidian on top. They sacrifice as well by putting the sentry and Scar down. Gunny with a well-earned Ms. Marvel this time takes an eight cube hit and now has to crawl his way back. Oh, this is going to be a tough one for Gunny now down nine to two in round three with an immediate snap from Cold saying, this has got to be your opportunity. You've got to like every opening hand from now on. And Gunny says, I do, takes it and moves into the first turn. The scar playing a big part in both players' decks right now as Ronan makes his first appearance in hand. Necrotia might cause some problems, but the zeroed out gladiators gotta feel good as both players are playing very tall cards. I like the idea of waiting and floating that glad. as they drop their own hood down into Necrotia, flip it to a demon, and Scarlet Witch the location to get the bonuses back on for the Death's Domain, with now Strange Academy on to boot. So the need to play into Death's Domain with that armor can be restricted. It can be held off knowing that there's the potential that everything could play out exactly as they technically both need. Lechugia makes it a lot harder also to want to play into that lane just because we know that Darkhawk is a thing. And they reveal their Ronin for the first time into Strange Academy as Darkhawk also comes on down, showing the growth threat in Lechugia. Let's see what drops into Death's Domain. It's the entire lot! dropping into death's domain. Everything, all four, drop in to the domain. And now Gunny's gotta figure out 
Is this enough to hold the Strange Academy and not need to worry about ramping that Darkhawk anymore? There's a Scar. There's a Maximus ramping up Ronin and an armor. 20 is the number to beat and a Scar is not going to do it. That's two more cubes off of cold and they continue to move on as Gunny still has not received the pigeon that gives the information about the meaning of Ms. Marvel. Here we go, there's your snap again. There we go. Small hood over in the right and a great portal, which helps both players here. Giganto could be a nice little surprise kicker. With a Korg Demon in the Bifrost, the both are projected to shift over to the Great Portal right now. Looking at potential protection line with Cosmo, speaks then to, to some security with Crossbones. Could also still drop down the Squirrel Girl. If they pull low, like Maximus, on the next turn. Because the Cosmo mid allows them to figure out if they wish to move it even further. The raft in a small little way could also end up helping Gunny if it ends up being a dead pull. But they drop down their Nico to flip the Scarlet Witch. There's gonna be no movements now as they get clogged with a ninja, even though they were filled by another demon. So now Shadowland is in danger. As Gunny now sits comfortably with the flexibility of playing into Shadowland with no concerns. That was a huge Scarlet Witch flip. As Crossbones makes it 13 in the mid, drops down the power of Scar, Sentry loses its void into the raft, so potentially screwing the fill of that lane. as they look at a Ronin potentially. Couple of options here of how they could fill out their lines. They could play wide with a Squirrel Girl with Scar. They could play tall and hope for a top deck of Maximus. And then solo the Shadowland with it. It lowers the Scar to 211. They don't pull the Maximus. So now their tallest play is to go for the tie break and put 12 into the mid. They have to put the Squirrel Girl elsewhere if they're going to do that. Oh, that's a little over the top there. There we go. All right, Gunny pulling out a 24 power mid as the number to beat. They are going to get an extra raft car just to say that they did. The ninjas are gonna go flying over and the Cull Obsidian keeps the Shadowland in Gunny's possession. That's another two. Two more chopped off of cold starting the comeback. It is now five to two. Looking for the Annie, plays around it, moves on and brings us to high stakes, which it's basically been for the last two rounds either way. Cold says, bring it on as Shuri's lab enters the battlefield. Tough, tough match for both players. With just a Korg in the mid, Sakaar dropping down almost anything right now would be big. 
However, you've got to hold on to that zero just in case if it pulls blob. Here's your hood. Puts a demon into the hand and the Sakaar's going to pull the blob bright and early. There's your 10 and there's your six. That's your Maximus and crossbones most likely in the blob. Pulling in a gladiator at 3-8. It'll double after, so it'll do the pull first, make its assessment, destroy or not destroy, then double up with the Shuri's lab. Sewer system kind of helping the Annihilus case here. As Glad pulls in a Cosmo, the only one of very few ways that an honor reveal will destroy that big space dog and armor who's just too late turns to a six. Big advantages here right now. As they already are sitting comfortably on a 211 scar by turn four. Thanks to the magic at hand. Protecting the blob now. Followed by a Cull Obsidian could be pretty large. Knowing that it would have to play into the Shuri's lab lane is also solid. Here's a sentry who gets zeroed out. No void needed. And this could end up just becoming a simple battle of Shuri's lab. Who's got the bigger double? The ongoings won't matter. Those Darkhawks are way less effective in this matchup. And instead, there's your zeroed out Cull Obsidian. It's six of one, half a dozen of the other, putting 20 into that lane. Here's the Annihilus to fly over the hood. Give a nine power lead into the sewer system. And now have a huge advantage with a 16 power destroyer behind Cosmo for the very first time. Gunny might be hanging on again. There's your destroyer. There's your scar. As they plop down their own scar, it's not enough in the middle lane. Here's a Scarlet Witch for the flipping of the white hot room. And cold shows their Iceman as they feel all the cold in their bones, knowing they're going down to a two out of three showdown. Here we go, round six. Ooh, what a nail biter. We start light though. We start with the negativity, we go into the hood. That brings us to New York. One of the most frustrating turn six locations in the game. As it is said, all of the confusion will happen. The indecisiveness of what will move, what won't move, when will it move? Is Shang-Chi real? All of that will come to be in New York. Priority is imperative, in my opinion, on this turn six play. Due to the registration of armor now. As it gets locked behind the miniaturized lab. Looking for either a clog or destroy. They play down their gladiator into New York, who's going to reach into the deck, pulls down the Darkhawk, who is not going to destroy. It's going to sit there pretty as Rock Slide beefs it up even further with more rocks. They only deck their Maximus to pull cards into their hand. Here's a sentry, again, taking advantage of not needing to worry about the miniaturized lab as it's closed off. Void doesn't become a concern. As Ronin for 19 looks to compete in New York. Remove potential movements at hand. While sitting on Destroyer, this has got to feel pretty decent. Because the rock slide is already down. I like the movement over to the left to create a little bit of confusion as Cull Obsidian and Korg drop down, give a little more power to that Darkhawk in the mid. Here comes the Ronin 
sitting on a total of 14 power. And now, while sitting on Destroyer, they're looking at moving over 17 and three. That's 20 more power to join New York. That would bring it to 34. Highest they could slide into that lane would be actually a Sentry to move, Sentry or Cull Obsidian to move for 10, plus an Annihilus. So the Destroyer, this should win it based on cold. Here's the lock. The armor moves over into New York. They play down to Scar to compete in Miniaturized Lab with the armor. It's not enough again. Gunny puts 30 and 16 on the board. And in a miraculous turn of events, Gunny has come back to bring it from 9-2 down to the final battle. It is two to one here in high stakes, so this is it. This round says all, as both players end up with a monster on the battlefield to start the match off. What an opening match for both of these players in season two of the Snap Judgments League. No matter what happens this round, both of them should be incredibly happy with this amount of competition and excitement as we go forward with a Nico Minoru into the big house, converting a demon over. As Wakandan Embassy is going to undo a bit of that demon benefit, but it's still pretty substantial to say the minimum. Sitting pretty with Destroyer and the monster. Looking to build up the Wakandan Embassy. Old still thinking through what's going to drop. They play everything into the big house. It's a Korg, which flips into the demon, plus armor, protecting that middle lane. And the singular rock gets top decked. This is tough. The huge lead advantage for the Wakandan Embassy now in favor of Gunny as they drop down a negative three on the hood. It might be just a simple battle for Monster Island at this point, because even if a hood flies over on turn five, that advantage is potentially enough because it won't destroy via Annie. Squirrel Girl gonna block the hood into place, plus playing down a Cull Obsidian, and they're sitting on Blob in their hand. Here's a Squirrel Girl that locks 24 to be the final total in the Wakandan Embassy. The Sentry is also gonna fight over. It's a fight for Monster Island. Sentry and Demon, the advantage is leaning towards cold. It's all in the hands of Blob. Here we go. Darkhawk versus Blob. Blob reduces that Darkhawk down and down and down and Blob goes up and up and up. And with that, Gunny comes back from the oblivion and wins what the five games in a row to take down cold. What a difference. What a match. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. GG's to both players. Stick around. We'll be right back. God damn it. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here to week one of the Snap Judgments League. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming. And we are casting these matches live here on twitch.tv backslash it's guest gaming. If you want to come hang out and watch these presentations Mondays, most often, occasionally on Tuesdays, we will be showcasing the highlight matches from the prior week of the Snap Judgments League. We're moving into our next battle now. It is going to be Philly versus 
Lufku, let's go see what they have to bring in this matchup. GG's, good luck, have fun. Neither is a stranger to competition. Let's see what happens here. Here we go. As Philly's gonna be rocking a lockdown Loki control deck. And Lufku, we don't know quite yet exactly, but knowing them and knowing that first card, I think it's pretty safe to say a Phoenix Force deck. Going for the armor, hoping that there isn't a Carnage on two and the interference of Oscorp Tower. Plus the Mindscape on top of it, pulling off that top turn. This is a nice snap here by Philly, taking advantage of it two times over. And a Murder World as well. Take the full clog, let both locations drop, risks out the quake, and drops Quinjet as magic's gonna remove the option of sending those cards over to Philly. Huh. And then we're just gonna flood our entire hand. Flood everything into the hand. Here's the Agent Coulson with the reduced down cards via Quinjet. Snowguard also pulls down a couple of cards. And Iron Lad's gonna pop off a Phoenix Force too early. Nothing's been destroyed. So instead, we drop down OG last so last week Leech. And they plop their own Iron Man to double up. Man, a roguing Iron Man to steal the bonus, plus a Hawk to shut it down. Lufka says it's not worth trying and not worth finding out. They decide to run, call it a day, give them two cubes, and 10 to 8, Philly takes the lead going into the next match. Once again, Human Torch on one. Do we get another armor top deck? No, not this time. This time we look at a potential interference play with Quake if they don't like their lines for it. That looks to seem to be the pointed direction they're on. Here's a cable of removing Nico Minoru from Lufku's deck as Carnage immediately gets rid of that Human Torch. And it's the double up spell. The debate really comes down to should you quake the Gamma Lab out or over or in to anything? Not sitting with Loki in hand makes it a much tougher decision. but instead they just go for the Coulson because Quinjet's down on the board, puts a 3-7 Proxima and a 4-8 Namora into their hands. The multiple man takes on the, the Gamma Lab Gamma Rays, and Nico flops in a Demon option. Keeping the competition strong in White Hot Room, they're going to take the extra energy and maybe drop 12. Guaranteed 8. It's only going to be 8. Phoenix Force comes on in. Here comes the Human Torch. Welcome back to the battlefield. And Gamora is just sitting at a, a, a 8, bringing 17 into the mid. Now it gets tough. Now it's a tough call. You're, you have 8 energy to work with at the moment. You're opting to see where they play out what. And the Human Torch moves mid, removing its potential risk of reduction via Shadow King. 
Lead automatically goes to Lufku, who puts down a tribunal from that iron lad, spreads everything across the board. The bonus from Atlantis is still gonna apply now. If that human torch moves off that lane. But we could see an Arnim Zola. A risky one at that, but we could see it. We could see... Ooh, a lot of options here. I think it really comes down to that Human Torch. If they want to... try to duplicate it or just move and hope, and is that gonna be enough? If it moves, it goes to 28. That's gonna add five to each lane organically. Plus, if it moves, Carnage would add five to that lane organically. It would go over the top. They have to compete with probably 20, and it looks like Devil Dinosaur at five power, plus the Shadow King two. It's only going to add seven. I don't think this is going to be enough. Unless they can truly hit it perfect with that Shadow King. It does. Yeah, Philly's making the right call here with the retreat. All of those reductions would be very, very, very tough to call. And at this point in the battle, it's too early to need to risk two cubes. Might as well only sacrifice the one. Good retreat from Philly on that. We move to round three. And now they sit with Loki in their hand. Final. Human Torch again, middle lane, turn one. Seems to be his favorite location to drop that Human Torch. As they sacrifice the Abbey, and Carnage does the removal. Armor one turn too late. As they reclog their, oh, go for the reclog and fail, because magic's gonna flip that location first, and they're not gonna get the card draw out of it. In a surprise move, they Loki on four without Quinjet down on the board, knowing that seven turns could be enough to work with. This essentially comes down to Magic and Jotunheim if they can pull it, and they don't. So now, you're trying to keep up. This is a game of keep up. Can you get enough power? Can you scale enough power? Fast enough? To compete in Jotunheim versus the Human Torch movie. and they just lightly curl out the onslaught for now. Ooh, as that Iron Man now drops into Nova Roma, really looking for, uh, ooh, no, no Rogue. Can't remember if Rogue was in the original, and Rogue is still in the deck. So this is a YOLO moment. If Iron Lad can hit Rogue, this'll be a huge moment for the battle. Human Torch moves into Jotunheim, sacrificing the one power to guarantee the location. The Onslaught makes it tougher now. Here it comes. It's the Quake, which is going to hit big as Jotunheim reduces down the magic and the carnage, bringing that middle lane closer to a tie. They needed to top deck that rogue from the Iron Lad and it just didn't connect. Yeah, the movement of Human Torch could double to 56, land into that Iron Man lane. 56 and seven, that's 63 times four. It just would have been way too much to have to deal with if they were still sitting on that human, uh, living tribunal. So good call there, good retreat, safe retreat. 
Let's see what happens here with Hellfire Club and Strange Academy on the board. As Venom is finally revealed, thanks to Cable. And the Venom cycle is tempting. But I think the Quake might make a lot more sense here to feed into that initial Cable. I like the idea, but hold on. Don't go crazy yet. Billy. They go for the snap. And they really like that Strange Academy. What do they see in the Strange Academy? As Lufku drops down into Bar Sinister on three and removes the multiplicity. Saying not today. Now just a curve play. Build some power over in the limbo. Strange Academy is showing too much presence. As they go for their own Iron Lad. Iron Lad's gonna hit the onslaught early with limbo already down. This could be a huge middle lane. sure if I understand the quake in the mid though I'm not sure I understand the quake in the mid of moving that magic maybe into the middle lane VSO looks to be the only option as they put the strange academy over on the right hand side now Cosmo drops on down and a multiple man that's gonna drop Cosmo and multiple man all over into the left so everything skips the mid and that rogue really needs to do work. The mid is a very attractive lane right now, and they still have the lead over in Limbo. This could be a two cube cheat here. Uh, sorry, four cube cheat here on turn six. And Lufku knows better and decides to run away, give them two cubes and not give them four. Damn. All right. And we open up with a Castle Zemo. Ooh, and Titan on top of it. Titan feels very good for Lufku. So if we can pull out some of those, that would be the hope. Cable pulls the Iron Lad, who's been a big player so far in the first couple of rounds. And Time Theater is going to duplicate the Iron Lad because it was technically the last card drawn, even though it wasn't drawn on turn, it was drawn via Cable. Interesting, I've never seen that mechanic play out where Time Theater copies the cabled card and we get a snap from Lufku. Sitting with a couple of sixes potentially in his hand, depending on Time Theater. They're going to push for four. They're pushing for four as magic gets rid of Titan entirely. It's not a concern for them. The time is more concerned, not the Time Theater. Iron Lad could hit Rogue, Mobius, Agent Coulson, Quake, Snowguard, and Quinjet. With a Loki still to boot for turn five. They decide to go for the high roll, take the Iron Lad and copy out the Snowguard to put two more cards in the hand. That's going to feel good for Loki as they'll also then draw six new cards in the next turn. Plus... They know, they know their next two turns of everything. 
and instead they're opting to take the full removal and play with the advantage of turning Limbo off again. Just going straight for it and it works. They drop down with the limbo. Deactivated, Iron Man goes into the time theater and it single lanes it. Devil Dino and a snow guard is gonna max out that devil dino. Is that enough if they drop it down? It's gonna be three and then nine. That's gonna put 12 into the time theater. That's gonna double up. That's gonna to go to 24. Magic makes it 26. If it divides it over, it divides it by three. That'll put into nine in each lane and that would be enough if we see that living tribunal pop into the time theater. That'll do it. And that keeps six cubes knocked off of Lufku, who's gonna be eliminated here in round number four. I don't even know at this point. It's all flying by as Philly knocks out Lufku. GG's, they took them down. Look, the Living Tribunal, Phoenix Force deck, these combo decks are incredibly difficult to pilot and Lufku is known for being an incredibly strong pilot with that deck. So to take that down is a huge testament to Philly and understanding the advantages of what Snow Guard can do. You don't have to Loki every hand to win. You just have to win two lanes in the right amount of rounds. Greatly appreciated on that contribution as well. We're going to take a short break here as we always do. So stick around. We'll be right back as we move into match number five here for week number one of SJL number two. I will see you all there. We're going to go right into it. Let's go to the next match, ladies and gentlemen. It is Ginger Prime versus Lost in the Shuffle. Let's see what they bring to the table today as we get a Kitty Pride, Shang-Chi, Craven Vision to open up. Could be a smooth sort of variation. Let's find out. And Sakar putting some extra placement down also could be very good right here, depending. As long as it doesn't pull the Shang-Chi, let's be honest. They're gonna drop down there, Craven. Look at a little bit of potential movement out from it. Here comes the Spider-Man who's just gonna slide on over into Mojo World instead. Give the priority with the Mojo World as Sakar is gonna reveal for Lost in the Shuffle a Scar. It's Scar and Sakar, and Sakar has a Scar. Plus, I'm weird. As Nocturne makes her appearance with the the potential to also ramp further. The Kitty Pride, I think, is the only contestion here of do you also bring in the Kitty Pride into Weir Island first right now? Cosmo not really going to be doing too much. It looks like we have a potential another big dumb idiot stack with Scar and Cosmo down on the battlefield. So keep an eye on how those scale. As we now get presented with Jeff and Kitty Pride who's gonna keep ramping the Muir Island and Gladiator's just gonna sit there, have a good time with an America Chavez. I know, I'm thinking the same things. Here we go with the Angela, probably followed by Kitty Pride. I'd assume into Muir Island to try to stack and compete, knowing that you've got two movable pieces afterwards. You could also drop the vision for some indecision, but the restacking at the end, depending on the top deck, is what this is all going to come down to. Is it needed to remove the Mojo World as they put down their own Crossbones, who's received already plus two power from that America Chavez? Great top deck for Lost in the Shuffle as they take the lead over Muir Island now. Now it's a question in competition of do you keep Mojo World? Do you have enough cards to, to maintain that line? I think with the Shang-Chi dropping down to, into Sakar, a little bit of movement and the Vision and Jeff, I mean, you've got three movable cards without the need to have to get rid of Mojo World. This is a very solid final turn here. As they move over the Jeff, the Vision, and the Nocturne. And they go for Mojo World removal. So instead of taking the four cards as a more likely play, given the big dumb idiots deck, 
Instead, they're just going to go for the Shang-Chi and just try, try to straight out power them in Mojo World. And that seems to be the case as Cannonball is going to shoot that Jeff back over to Muir Island. And Shang-Chi is going to hit that Scar, but it's no longer going to be enough in the mid because of the magic of Cannonball. Kitty Pride, Nocturne, and Vision. Looks like that's going to be it, unless if there's a miracle out of the hub, but it's not going to happen. And just like that, two cubes have been removed from the hair of the ginger. And we move on to round number two. Huh. All right, Cannonball in a big dumb idiot's deck. Makes a lot more sense now thinking about that America Chavez as you increase the number of tens via the Gladiator and the Cannonball. That now makes you start thinking what other eight power cards could potentially be in this deck that would give that benefit and boost. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments and in the chat before the end of this match. What else could be in this deck if they're trying to take advantage of more than two cards? Raven? Into X-Mansion is a little interesting just because it's going to be a lane clog automatically. Range Academy feels good, though, in that third spot. Definitely feels good in that third spot. And here's the Gladiator pulling down into the X-Mansion. It's going to be Nocturne, who's going to unfortunately get destroyed. An expansion RNG. What do you have for us to see? It's an echo followed by their own nocturne now. Back from the dead into the expansion, debating about should it move into White Hot Mansion. They go for a Hope Kitty line to open up turn four. Nocturne's going to toss out the magic of White Hot Room and put a cloning vats in its place as Hope Summers move over the Silk into the Craven Lane, buffs up Craven by two, pops a Hope Summers into the hand now, just like the Kitty Pride, duplicating that as Kitty Pride herself bounces back in, and now they have the option to really ramp up some extra power if they want to, with a couple of Red Hulks thanks to the magic cloning vats. Very flexible turn six here, depending on what they drop on the opposite side, knowing that there's a 17 power Rolk already down, yet alone it could scale even higher. I like the double Red Hulk threat, knowing you can, you can also still drop down three cards on the final turn. But if you just want to go big and tall, you go big and tall. Silk also could potentially swing out into the Strange Academy if they plop down that duplicated Red Hulk over into Expansion, as they're going to plop in a Maximus, which is going to prevent the copy of that Red Hulk and lock it in place safely behind the Cosmo. So now the flexible option has now turned into an uh-oh option. Now they've got to look at the potential power swing that happens via Silk. I think the safest way, because Lost in the Shuffle's got the priority here, right? You've got that Silk that's going to be able to swing on out, and there's a snap back. We have eight cubes on the line, and they have a line to victory, but they're not going to try to take it. They have multiple lines of victory here, and they opt out with a Shang-Chi in hand. So many ways that Silk can move that you could control. Ginger Prime, what do you see that I don't? Chat, let me know. Comments, let me know. There were so many different ways to win that lane. But man, only losing two is always going to feel better than definitely losing eight. I get that. So we move on to round number three.
Nice pull from the Sanctuary too, giving the Soul Stone for the benefit of Lake Hellas. Whew. As armor is now going to protect that stone from any potential destruction, but looks to be trying to compete in Lake Hellas now too. As the Central Park fills up that lake with more squirrel bodies and makes the clogging aspect a little more difficult for these craven movable pieces to move with. You do have your Hope Summers and Elsa Bloodstone, which is going to really love your turns two, three, four, and five. Sorry, you turn three, four, five, and six. As you can now look at playing Elsa Bloodstone into Kitty Pride onto Hope Summers for turn number four. Get that ramp up and going. Get those extra pieces up and down. Looking pretty solid right now if you're Ginger Prime. Not snappable solid, but very solid nevertheless. Here they go. We're gonna get the two extra energy plus two extra power. Puts the crossbones into Central Park, takes the extra power themselves, and now they're floating on seven going into turn number five. Uh, oh man, lots of moving pieces here. But that vision's got to be the most comfortable. You can play down your vision, play down your angel even, or just play into your craven with the double ramping extra safety. Angela looking weaker and weaker versus the Craven because you've got multiple move options available to you. Nocturne Jeff could present two moves into a Craven lane of Central Park, building up either the Jeff or the Nocturne in the process. Instead, they're going to opt for a single move over of that vision potentially. And now it presents indecision with Central Park as they drop their own Scar into Lake Hellas to swing it up to 14 power. 18 in the lead right now for Sanctuary 2 feels good. But by sliding that vision over into Lake Hellas, that's going to ramp them only to 20 power at max. And they're going to have to drop a 7 power card into Lake Hellas, which is very doable considering the 16 point lead into Central Park. We're now looking at... Now looking at... How do you steal Central Park? Taking all of the zeros and all of the ones, they look at the ramp of what can you do in there. Angela can shoot up to a total of four. Nocturne would be the highest left in hand. That would bring that to five. Angela goes up, it goes to seven. If they then also drop a Kitty Pride, uh, sorry, uh, a Kitty Pride or Silk, it doesn't matter. Either one of those. That would bring it up to 14. It wouldn't be enough. They have to move the vision into that lane first, then Nocturne it if they want to try to go over the top. It's only sitting on 14 power. Sorry, 16 power when all is said and done because of the Elsa Bloodstone buff. If they retract... They have the potential to use their Kitty Pride again into that middle lane for seven power, which would overall drop the value. Beautiful alignment right there. Here you go. Ronan comes down, who's a little weaker due to all the cards, but Maximus is going to bring that back up. Seven's going to be contestable as Vision moves over with the Angela. Goes up plus two. There's your Silk getting seven on top of it. Uncontested. Going to stay in the move. Nocturne moves up to seven with the Elsa Bloodstone bonus as well. And that's two more cubes to go into the mix. But this time they pop off of Lost in the Shuffle. Moving on into number four. That Mind Stone in Central Park was the demise of that final turn. Not allowing the flexibility. We open Kitty Pride into America Chavez. Looking to hit one of those eights.
and armor flops into DC with a Jeff into the unknown. Unknown flips and reveals over to machine world. Could actually benefit both players. We get a snap from Lost in the Shuffle. Very light hand for Ginger Prime right now. As Cosmo keeps Hell's Kitchen in a little bit of a controlled state. They move to Angela Silk with the batting potential from DC. 10 power gladiator that's going to drop down that scar to 11 safely now. To 411, excuse me. As they get the 10 power vision in the process with the move flexibility. There you go, Angela goes, Silk bats over to Machine World, Ronin popping down on five. We're looking probably then at at least Maximus coming down again. The question is where, and can you do enough to stay competitive with it? The Craven, then the movement, then the movement. I like it. Ooh, I'd be careful with that Spider-Man because you want that Kitty Pride bonus. Really banking on that Spider-Man moving to the right. Heavily moving on the right side of the bank. There's your machine world. Here we go. Craven, go Craven goes on down, takes the double advantage of Vision and Jeff. Spider-Man comes on down, swings it over into the machine world, who's going to pull over just the armor. And that's going to plop down a total of 10, but that's going to change in a moment as that silk is also going to get it moved from the other side as Cannonball comes over, hits the silk out of the way, currently into the Craven. And that locks then Ginger Pride into a positive position for four cubes to be chopped off the bottom of Lost in the Shuffle. Yeah, a little risky with the cannonball. I agree with chat here. A little risky, but intriguing nevertheless. And opting for Angela in Sinister London. Tip a personal preference for me is to stay away from that just because of the duplication Angela normally ending up being a pretty dead card very often. Because you're looking for all the duplications and in this case now movements, but it could backfire potentially too. The double bloodstone's gonna have to be the safe line here. Now with the threat of Los Diablos removing the double movements, as Maximus puts two cards in the hand and Elsa Bloodstone's galore up here, Angela goes up two and Los Diablos destroys that sinister. Keeping a lead for Lost in the Shuffle here with two cubes on the line. Raven and Silk poke in. as they plop in a 14 power crossbones. <laughs> Thanks to the double reinforcements added on from the two American Ch Chavai? Chavez is is is? Chavez? Chavai? I'm not sure. Would you say Chavez is or Chavai? As now they debate for turn five, how to not end up in a negative backfire situation because of the movement of Silk. There's the Ronin exclusively, as they're now going to have seven energy to work with on the final turn, because Jeff also comes on down. Silk doesn't move. The downside is that Ginger Prime does not have the priority. So expecting that Silk to not be there is very important.
and yet a Spider-Man Nocturne 3535 doesn't really feel that strong right now. Because there's uncertainty associated with the Silk. If Lost in the Shuffle doesn't play into the left, this ends up being a very good line because that Kitty Pride will take its point advantage from the two Bloodstones and then move the Silk over. If it doesn't play that line and they hit the Silk first, we may have a problem, Houston. Lots of options here to work with, but very difficult final turn, no matter how it runs. And the steal of Dovaroma is much more appealing to Lost in the Shuffle than attempting to try to regain Los Diablo space. And they go ahead and place down just the armor to protect that Ronin in Los Diablos. His Scar makes an appearance in the ruins, bats over the Silk, ramps up that Craven. It's not enough in the middle lane. Elsa Bloodstones give extra power to that Rolk, plus the Angela and the Hope just for funsies. But it's not enough with the ruins. Therefore, four cubes are being shaved off of the Redhead. And we move to round number six. Four to two, it's now all down to knockout. Loss has to win one, Ginger has to win two. Can we see another down to the wire final battle here? And we get a peak. Peak Craven's gotta feel pretty okay knowing that you're sitting on a three, four Shang-Chi. Yes, it came at the expense of two, five, three movable cards in your hand, but three, four Shang-Chi always feels good. Especially when accompanied with an Elsa Bloodstone. As they're going to take advantage of the destroy from Hotel Inferno, Elsa Bloodstone's going to remove out their blob who hadn't been played, and Cosmo as well is going to remove out too. Now they're sitting on Hope Summer. And a big, big lead from a big, big card. Brand new Crossbones sitting at 410. Has huge value coming from it and to it. Especially in these big, dumb decks. Weird mismatch of cards to work with here. Shang Chi Ronin. Ginger knows. It's not feeling good. It's not looking good. I'm gonna have to say it's enough. They forfeit the peak and they know that Lost in the Shuffle did too. And somehow the protection of armor comes out in perfect timing for Lost in the Shuffle. And like that. The Ginger has been eliminated. Ginger Prime losing to Lost in the Shuffle here in round one of the Snap Judgments League. Week one, season two. I'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the broadcast so far as we head to our final featured match of the day for week one of season two here at the Snap Judgments League. Let's swing on over there and join up with the presentation of Alf Insidious versus Buddy Casino. Both of them have different names in the Discord, but we're going to call them by their in-game names because Alf Insidious is just such a great great name. So 
Let's go for it. Let's see what happens here. Good luck. Have fun. Because look, you're playing Howard the Duck. I can't be mad at you. Howard the Duck from Alf Insidious with a inked Jeff, inked Howard, inked Mystique, Golden Lizard. I like the way they are rolling as they play their own Jeff with Titan on the board and Hell's Kitchen to draw some one, one drops. Neither player draws a one cost card. If you watch the animations closely, you saw neither player take advantage of it. That means Buddy is not running any one costs in their entire deck or they're still sitting on a one cost in their hand. This would be why it's a full on discard, which means with Jeff at play, this is discard ramp. Here we go. Hmm. Two movers with the Nightcrawler. The winning card is hands down going to be the Professor X as we get a snap from Buddy. While a Spectrum is guaranteed to come out if Iron Lad takes the hit here. Howard will go up, Lizard will go up, Spectrum will be drawn. As Jubilee is gonna drop out a blink, which will get rid of that glaive. Whoa! Holy Batman, okay. That was a lot to take in. Jubilee pulled Blink. Blink tossed the Corvus Glaive back into the deck, pulled out the leader, and then that leader brought a copy of the Iron Man down into Hell's Kitchen. It procced because Iron Lad had already been converted into Spectrum, but no one reveals happened, so it's just a six power card. As OG53 Leech drops down, removes the benefit of the Spectrum, but they've already locked down Hell's Kitchen for an advantage. Sitting on just a 5-7 and a 3-0, both, both cards would actually still be able to take advantage of Washington, D.C. because they're now considered no ability cards. So that would be 10 power in the mid if they chose to play it, bringing it up to 17. They could still Jeff. Moving Jeff into Titan, potentially. And even Jeff may be moving into Hell's Kitchen, depending on what they're looking to spread out with. What trick does Buddy have up their sleeve? And I like the 10 power play here. Rather than trying to get cheeky and divide and conquer, I like the 10 power play here, knowing that Hell's Kitchen is more than likely locked in, given the scenario. More than likely. Locks it in, he goes for it, he says it's gonna be enough and Buddy's still debating. It says out of time, but was the hella drop of bringing back the Odin Jubilee Blink, which will retrig, and there's your Dr. Doom on top of it. It is gonna be enough into the Washington DC. It really depended on where that Doom was gonna land more than anything else, and if it would draw first. If it had drawn first, it would have put eight power into the DC if it drawed first and played into the left at any point, hence the risk of what could potentially drop. Understandable risk for Buddy. Took it and won. Nightcrawler Ravona to kick us off. So now a 4 1 Profex is a viability, and Buddy is now aware of this scenario. Knowing that they have their Jeff on the board, they've got to feel much better about it. And we get a snap as they try to lock down the machine world early. 
knowing that Jeff would have to move out to commit. Buddy opts to not have to deal with it. Not sure about where they're going to play down that Profex. Do they sit on their own, Jeff? Is Ravona going to be worth worth uh, trying to compete for in that lane by playing down and restricting that Nebula? Too much indecision. They go ahead and sacrifice the cube. They're already up still 9-6, so worthwhile play. As Alf Insidious is rocking the brand new Hellfire Gala Ms. Marvel inked. Absolutely classy looking card. Nice beginning advantage here with Castle Blackstone. As they look to try to snipe out Formir quickly. And maybe play out the Ms. Marvel as needed. Howard the Duck, thank you for your time and service. You're going to disappear into the Vormir and allow for the Lizard to survive. As Electro gets a nice, nice location for it. Buddy is very happy right now having the, that extra energy every turn. As they move to side, is the YOLO energy of Iron Lad worth it here, sitting on Ms. Marvel, sitting on a four-cost Iron Man? It makes sense to take those risks right now and keep a lead in Castle Blackstone. Iron Lad is now a Night Crawler. And with a one drop being drawn next, that Ms. Marvel looks even more appealing than it did before. The snap drops as they load up that Iron Man, looking to maybe play down both Ms. Marvel and Cosmo on the next turn if they can keep that lead in Castle Blackstone. But he is scared of the Prof X, ladies and gentlemen. Not sure when and where it's gonna come down at any point. It is a very, very strong card in this matchup too, with or without Jeff the Baby Landshark, as both players are gonna be starting with six cards in their hand. And Alpha is gonna start with a Howard, so their whole deck will be at play. As Grand Central is gonna get a guaranteed drop here for turn five. And an Avengers compound could really heavily restrict what happens in Grand Central. They know Jeff is coming. So they spread their resources for the Ms. Marvel, put the one in the two cost in each of the lanes rather than the original layout of 2 2 1 1. There goes a leech from Corvus Clave. So all of your ongoings. In your, with, with all of your ongoings in your hand, you've got to feel pretty confident. This could be a casserole lead. Depending on the hit here. And it's the Prof X to lock it down. And Jubilee ain't going to add a single thing into the Avengers compound. Great hit by that Iron Lad, restricting the players. As we now get a Jeff added into Grand Central just to play him on out, keep the curve. I like it. I like it. I like it. There's Jeff. They have their own Jeff. And it's going to drop down that Ms. Marvel for free. Give five, uh, excuse me, uh, five power onto each side. As Vision also gives some flexibility to Olympia too. 
Avengers Compound doesn't look like a winnable location right now, even with a Jeff, even with a potential Ms. Marvel on their side. It doesn't look like a winnable location right now. It's just loaded all up with a ridiculous amount of points. Ms. Marvel's on board, Iron Man, Mystique. Even sliding over that Jeff might be worthwhile. Just to super reinforce the Avengers compound because you only have to win two lanes. You don't have to compete for all three. Ravona to the rescue right here, ladies and gentlemen. Getting out that double combo for the final turn. Iron Man Mystique always feels good. Facts in the chat about Jeff moving over into the compound. You drop your Ms. Marble bonus, so you actually weaken it by two points. Very, very true. Good call in the chat. This is why we do this live, folks, because I know what I know, but I don't know what I don't know. Here it goes. There's your Iron Man and Mystique for 40 power in Olympia. That ain't gonna cut it versus Vision Jeff. As they plop down a Rulk to compete in the mid, and that's four cubes, y'all. Chopped out the bottom of the casino. And now we've got a six to four lead advantage Alvin's Alvin Sidious. Beautiful lines right there. And a huge hit, huge hit from the Iron Lad. Project Pegasus. Here, you can have all of the energy now here on turn one. Merry Christmas, have fun. We've only got six. Might as well try to hit big. And they go for the Iron Lad in the right, and they also go for their right blindly. So even if it was a blinded out uh, Prof X, would have been a solid hit, but Vision Big play also, lots of confusion this will bring on the next couple turns. Howard now just drops as an ongoing. Mystique is being drawn next. Negative zone. They're drawing on a Jeff for turn four. Doesn't feel very good. Doesn't have to be very good. Just has to feel a little better than what this does. But let's see how Buddy utilizes that vision in the next few turns as they drop their own Electro Ramp down on turn three. We do have Iron Man on the draw with Mystique in hand and Ravona down. Mystique is now a completely useless card at 2-0 with no ability, but Iron Man still has something to work with. Yeah, you're already in for two. Might as well push a little more. Alpha Insidious doesn't like the line. The removal of that Mystique ability was pretty big to lose the competition in the left in the mid lane. So Alpha Insidious and Buddy Casino are now tied at four cubes apiece going into round number six. Nice little bit of energy, but you're still referencing the Ravona. Ooh, Electro again. And a Castle Blackstone again. Now with four on the board, 
could maybe curve out that Iron Man Mystique Jeff. They'd like that line just as much. Knowing Spectrum is in hand, that Mystique is going to get the extra bonus. Definitely has to feel good. Here's a Corvus Glaive tossing out that Doctor Doom and Leader. Keep an eye on how many ongoings end up down on Buddy Casino's side of the battlefield. Y'all, they are in for four cubes. They are both down to four cubes. These will be the final four cubes here for week one here at the Snap Judgments League. They're going to put down that Mystique over into Atlantis. Double up that Nightcrawler. And offer some flexibility on the final turns. Ooh. There's a Rulk. Rulk is fine. Rulk is manageable when you're sitting on an Iron Man in that lane. It's now turn five. They lost the power, the energy advantage. So the spectrum on six did disappear. And Lizard's going to be pretty safe over in Atlantis, too, just because the chances of them playing four cards into Atlantis by turn the end of turn six feels very, very limited. You've got three ongoings already stacked to Castle Blackstone that you can ramp up as they ramp out their Hella which drops a couple of Doom bots, one over in, into Atlantis, one over into Castle Blackstone. The leader comes on down, takes a copy of the Lizard, sends it over to Atlantis. They do fill that line. This Lizard's also going to drop to one, but their Lizard can also drop to one simultaneously. And now... The math begins. With the opt of Jeff moving to the left, that brings Atlantis two, three, six, plus two from Spectrum would be eight, plus two from Mystique would be 10. That would be 20 power if they do it. No movable options in Atlantis, plus their lizard also goes down. It feels good. It looks good for Alpha Insidious, but does Buddy have something up his sleeve? There you go. There's your movement. Here comes the Odin to put in another Doombot into the Castle Blackstone. Tinkerer's workshop's going to be secured and locked in officially for 18 power when all is said and done. Put on the extra Doombot. Spectrum ramps it on up, and it's 20 and 36 for Alpha Insidious. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what knocks out Buddy Casino here in round number one for week number one of the Snap Judgments League. This is the beginning of a long series of casts here on its guest gaming Twitch channel. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me today as we broadcast these live here weekly, and I will see you all next week here at the Snap Judgments League. Thank you so much for watching today's broadcast. I hope you enjoy the content. If you do, like and subscribe down below, and I will see y'all next time.